Happy 4th of July. So this episode has absolutely nothing to do with American independence, unfortunately. I should really start planning things ahead for the holidays. What you're about to hear is a Bible discussion from a meeting about a month ago. I wanted to discuss practical steps in theology for how to apply the law to yourself today. Some really tough questions came up. I wanted to say, while my demeanor is usually pretty confident, I want to let you know that since this was recorded, I have found other scripture passages that contradict some of the things we discussed and views that I personally held. I went ahead and removed those parts of the discussion. The whole purpose of this meeting was to sharpen each other. So you take the good and you leave the bad. This is for you, the listener. Please listen to this like there's some bad theology that I've sneaked in here because there undoubtedly is. I was trying to find out myself what of the things that I believe is wrong. That's that's why I do this. Everything here was spoken in good faith, and I left the meeting very much encouraged. Where I'm right, I hope it challenges your own thinking. And as always, I'm absolutely delighted to be shown where I contradict scripture. Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. Who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? My name's Adam Terrell, and I'm here to encourage you to obey the law and think about it and speak about it constantly. I broke the law. Christ paid my debt by sacrificing himself so that I can be clean to offer myself as a living sacrifice back to God. The entire Mosaic law is obligatory for everyone. Keeping some of the laws look different today because the light of further revelation supersedes shadows in the old law. The temple sacrifices are an example where we have something better. Note that we must still obey the Mosaic laws for sacrifices. There is still a temple, and priests are still required to offer sacrifices. It's just that the priests, the sacrifices, and the temple are all better now. God will show grace to those who apply the law to themselves, to those who have hidden the law in their hearts, and he will judge those who disobey accordingly. I must apply it to myself and then those around me will see its fruit and be drawn to its goodness. Theocracy grows by the sword of the Spirit, God's word, and self-sacrifice. The law's purpose is to give a path to restoration. Christ has restored me, so I must seek to restore others by sacrificing myself. Thanks for listening. My goal with each conversation is to edify and bring the law and wisdom to bear on each person's current situation in life. Let's jump into this week's interview. I read the Bible and I think, how, how can I obey this? Not, oh gosh, that seems really hard. How do I not have to, how can I spiritualize that? Or how can I not have to do what it clearly says? Because that would be very countercultural and that would, that just sounds really harsh. And I'm already guilty of that. So I think I'm very thankful that I've been raised in a family to where I'm not guilty of quite a bit, especially the more serious things that are in there. And so I think that's probably one of the things that's made me even open to the idea. Hmm. I guess maybe my question is, uh, how much of the law is applicable for us today as Christians? How much did Christ's death nullify? And, um, you know, because when the law, this is my understanding, when the law is mentioned in Scripture, it can mean, it has a few different meanings. It, the law can mean the complete Old Testament law mm-hmm. the Duke, as laid out in the Duke, or... Um, yeah, it can be the entire it can Old be Testament. The, the Ten Commandments. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I guess that's my question is how much of it applies to us today as Christians and how much of it doesn't? Right. So I guess that would be my main question and the main things that I'd like to explore. So the first one you said, what did Christ nullify? And the answer is none. In Matthew 5. No, well, no, he didn't. So he fulfilled it, he right? Fulfilled he did it. not annul it. Right. So yeah, Matthew Wrong 5. I put it on my part. Matthew 5. But I, it's weird, though, because I think a lot of people do. Like, that's a synonym that they have. Fulfill and nullify are very different. Very different. He fu- he fulfilled Fulfill in the sense the that he obeyed it. He yeah. obeyed it. He fulfilled the requirements of the law. He died. Right. So Matthew 5, 
17, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I came not, I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Well, then the question is, well, what is all is accomplished? Me. If that's his death, then the law is passed away. And in a sense, for us believers, the law has passed away because we are no longer under the curse of the law. Because um, Paul uses the example, in the law of marriage, husband and wife are married, if one of them dies, then the one that still lives is dead to that law of marriage because the spouse died. Mm -hmm. And so it's the same as us with Christ. Christ died, and so we're, not, we're no longer under the law for a penalty. And that's what Christ used to place the law in our hearts. Um, there's quite a few passages in the Old Testament that says that the New Covenant is when God writes the law on our hearts. So wait a minute, if we're dead to the law, and this is, I mean, Paul goes into great detail in this in Romans 12. Um, if we're dead to the law, how can we, how can it be written on our hearts? Is, was, did the act of writing it on our hearts make us dead to the law? What does that mean? Now, what, what is, where is, uh, where is that scripture verse? Uh, this one in Matthew? No, I found the Matthew one, Matthew 5, right? Uh, yes, the, the one. one about um, um, the law is written on our hearts. Oh, uh, yeah, there's quite a few of those in the Old Covenant. Um, Jeremiah 31 and 33, uh, Hebrews 8, 10, Hebrews 10, 16, Isaiah chapter 2, Micah chapter 4. And then in Matthew 5, going on to verse 19, it says, Whoever annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. This is Matthew 5. Yeah, Matthew yeah. 5, Sermon on the Mount. Okay, so the, all is accomplished here, says in my notes, that that would be the full man manifestation of God's kingdom, for which believers are afraid. That okay. would be your view, right? Yes, that would be yeah. my view. Your view, uh, can, you, can you say that one more that time? The, the law will be accomplished when the kingdom is full, is in its fullness. So at the end time? At the, at the end, the, the end to end. Okay. When we're in the eternal state. Do you have anything to... Uh, base that with on your definition of all that is accomplished. I mean, it makes sense, but... Well, the, I guess another way that you could, somebody somebody could take that would be all is accomplished, meaning that um, Christ said when he died, it is finished. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, then now we can nullify the law. Except for it says until heaven and earth. Pass away. Yes. And so, yeah, I would not hold that view. So That's the only other way that I could that I could see somebody reading that passage. So it's about the heaven and earth that makes you think that in times. Yeah, until heaven and earth pass away, because we know we know there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. In which case, the only reason that the law exists is, is to show that we're sinful, because where there is no sin, there is no law. And Christ takes the law a step further in the uh, following passages, where he says, "You have heard that it was said, you shall not murder, but then but then I say to you that whoever looks at his brother with um, hate in his heart, hate in his heart." So he actually takes it. A step further mm -hmm. past what the law yeah. says. Yeah, so he goes. To, he goes to the motivations, not just the outward actions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that opened opened my eyes up to thinking this way was a different view of eschatology than what I was raised in. I was raised uh, as a dispensationalist, and I probably at the time couldn't even tell you what that meant. Um, Can you define that for me? Real quick? Dispensationalist is. Uh, have you ever read any of the Left Behind books? No, but I've heard it's, them. It's that whole thing. It's. Um, when Israel became a nation again in 1947, that started a countdown clock for Daniel, Daniel's uh, 70th week and one more generation that started the clock counting again from the time that Jesus said, uh, this generation won't pass away until all these things take place. The temple, uh, a lot of things with the temple, wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes. So within a generation of Israel being restored in 1947, I think, that started one last span of 30 years and there were all kinds of books being written about why Jesus would return in 1987. Because a generation, they said a generation, at first was 30 years, so it was 77, and that didn't happen. So they said, okay, well, it could be 40 years since, and they moved it to 87. They said, oh, well, we're off by a year. And my dad has all these books. Like, there's a book that he has called 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 1988. <laughs> so now it's more than a generation past that. So now people are, there are still some people that are saying that a generation can't be 70 years. <laughs> I don't know anybody who's having children when they're 70. Uh, except by a miracle. Mm. Um, so is that what, um, when those, uh, when that prophecy didn't happen, is that when your dad started reevaluating? Um, no, actually, my dad didn't start reevaluating until all the, he realized that all the people that he looked up to and were really serious about Bible study, um, a lot of the people like the, I think, Ken Ham, who started Answers in Genesis, 
a lot of people who had different ministries that we really learned a lot from and heavily appreciated. None of them were dispensationalists. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And then the, my dad thought, well, the only reason that I know why uh, Tommy Nelson was a dispensationalist is because Tommy said he paid too much money not to be a dispensationalist because he went to Dallas Theological Seminary. He probably, but... He joked, he, Tommy Nelson, he jokes about that. Yeah, yeah, but it seems like... Well, he would know better than to do something just based on money instead of based on what. Well, I think he would obviously agree with that, but he jokes that. He said, yeah, of course I'm a dispensationalist. I spent too many years in school and paid too much money to my teachers to be anything else. Mm-hmm. He joked, he obviously, he believes it, but I, I think he, he jokes about that, knowing that people have, people have probably accused him. That's the reason that he is one. So he says it tongue in cheek. Mm-hmm. Um, but why would uh, dispensationalism say something different? Like... So I think the reason that a lot of people are not particularly amicable to seeing the law as uh, worth worth very much of our study. No, as far as uh, the prophecy of Daniel goes. It's really weird and complicated. I can't even explain a lot of it to you. I used to know what it was, and it's just so it's so convoluted. Um, they basically say that at the end, I think it's the end of either I think it's the end of the book of Ezekiel, or maybe the beginning. There's a uh, the prophet has a vision of a restored temple, okay. of, a, of a built temple. And their view is that we're supposed to be looking forward to it when the temple is rebuilt a third time. Instead of the generation or whatever. So that, that's the, <laughs> the The temple being rebuilt a third time, so they believe that we're looking forward to, and that's also why we want Israel to be successful um, and be able to go ahead and tear down that mosque and rebuild the temple. Because if they're allowed to do that, then that's what will basically usher in the, the, the final reign of Christ in his kingdom. Mm-hmm. And so they're looking forward to when the Jews reinstitute animal sacrifices. Hmm. And I, for the longest time, um, my dad hadn't really thought about that, and we hadn't really thought about that. And then the question, I mean, I would ask the question, so why do you want to go back to the shadows? Hmm. Why are dispensationalists looking back to the shadows that we want to, we want to go back to the thing that caused God to destroy Israel? in AD 70. There's a reason God destroyed the temple. It's because we don't need it anymore. It was always a shadow. So why do we want to go back to the shadows? But then they say that going back to the law is bad because that's Old Testament. But you're the ones who want to go back to animal sacrifices. Okay, but you're saying that uh, once the temple is rebuilt, then that's what should have started the generation uh, as said in Daniel, instead of... They were thinking that the temple would be rebuilt before the end of that generation. That, that, that Israel coming together again as a nation state was what started that countdown. I, I think they would they would say that uh, the rebuilding of the temple would have started to ha- should have started to happen within... the Them becoming a nation again was what started the countdown. And then within that generation, the temple would, would have been rebuilt, probably completed at the end of that. Mm-hmm. And it still isn't. Um, my view of... And I want to see, see what the right book... Um, vision of the temple uh, it's in Ezekiel my view is that Ezekiel is seeing that temple as before it was destroyed because in Ezekiel's time it was it had already been destroyed when the temple was rebuilt like the one that was standing in Jesus's day was not to the same size and specifications as the one that Ezekiel saw in his vision Ezekiel saw Solomon's temple which was like three times larger than the one that was rebuilt because Israel was um, uh, the kingdom of Judah was destroyed, Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was destroyed when Babylon came and captured Israel. Babylon takes them, Nebuchadnezzar takes them into captivity, and then they're there for, I think it's 70 years in captivity, and then they're brought back and they rebuild Jerusalem and they rebuild the temple, but the temple is much smaller. Okay. It's not the same size and splendor as it was that Solomon built. And the one that Ezekiel sees a vision of is the destroyed one that was the exact same specifications as Solomon's temple. So I think he's seeing a vision of back when it was, not a future of when it'll be rebuilt bigger than the one that was in Jesus' day. Anyway, I think that whole discussion is irrelevant <laughs> because we have the true temple now. The true temple has, has always been God dwelling in his people. And the temple was a picture a picture of that, that we were commanded to observe that shadow in that picture in the Old Testament. and the New Testament, I think it would be blasphemous to go back to that yeah. because it would be saying that Christ didn't come and didn't die which the Jews want because they don't believe that Christ can live. Our bodies are now the temple of Christ. Mm -hmm. The church body as a whole is God's temple. Mm -hmm. Well, in our individual bodies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, each one of us has the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Our bodies are described as both a living sacrifice and the temple. Mm -hmm. And a temple. We're living living stones, members of the temple, Mm -hmm. and we're the sacrifice, and we're the the priest. Yes. Every believer is a fully functioning temple sacrificial system walking on two legs. Which is great because now I don't have to fly to Jerusalem every day. Right? (laughs) 
when can you tell me uh, when I can stop uh, uh, kneeling and bowing to the east uh, during my new career? <laughs> when is that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. No. Uh, a couple thousand years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I remember when okay. I read that, my dad was like, I always thought that that was just a Muslim thing, that you have to like bow to Mecca. I'm like, no, that's in, that's in the Bible too. You're supposed to pray. I forget when it is, but there's a certain time where you're actually supposed to face the temple. Or is it just the east? I can't remember. But there's a certain direction that you are supposed to face for a certain prayer. Mm. I guess to me, maybe a little bit, because I think we probably agree on the, the parts of the law uh, that are based on you know, the, the moral parts of the law and everything. Mm-hmm. So I guess maybe where we might differ is the application of the political parts of the law to us today. Yeah. Um, because obviously we're not living under a theocracy right now. Um, or we're not I would say we are. It's not just not a biblical one. Okay. <laughs> yes. Very true. So I think every society has always been under one. It's just a question of which gods and laws is it. Mm-hmm. Right now it's the American government. Right. A humanist god. Mm-hmm. Because if there is no god, then the only thing higher than man is collective man. Mm-hmm. Large groups of men. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a quote. That's, yeah. not, that's not mine. That's a brush duty quote. I knew it was too deep for you, Adam. <laughs> I get a lot of this stuff from everybody else. I think Same. of what's good. Same. I'm just, I'm just a sponge. I try to be a sponge. I try to be a, a filter. Filter. Well, okay, not, not yes. a filter because a filter only absorbs the bad stuff. <laughs> uh, I try to be downstream of a filter. This so, is a sponge downstream of a filter. This is my filter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so going back to the, the end times question, all the parables that Jesus told talking about what the kingdom is like. In Matthew 13, he said the kingdom is like, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all other seeds, but when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. He spoke another parable to them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. So the kingdom is a small thing that grows continually over time, and at the end it will be big and fully realized. So it's a slow growth thing. The way that leaven spreads throughout a loaf of bread, the way that a mustard seed grows into the biggest tree. Um, this, the dispensationalist view is that the church is shrinking and undergoing hardship, and things get worse and worse and worse until we finally basically lose the culture war, and then Jesus comes and, and kills everybody and sets up, bam, you get an immediate, fully blown kingdom. So it's sort of like a downward slope, and then at the end, it's here you go, you have it. Versus my view is that it started very small, Jesus planted the seed, and it's grown very slowly, and you can hardly even see it over time until you look back 2,000 years and see how bad things were. We have cell phones now. So empires are still rising and falling, but our lives are better, even still. Okay, like, we're not setting people on fire and using them as torches to light our parties. So you're thinking that right now there are more Christians than there were however long ago? Maybe not necessarily more, but better. The ones that are around uh, have a better understanding of God and are more obedient. And even even the unbelieving world is more obedient, whether they would acknowledge whether that's a good thing or even care to think about it. More obedient to Christ or to their own gods? To Christ. I'd say probably when when there is a bunch of suffering and persecution, they're they're probably better quality Christians, um, as opposed to like right now, at least in America. Yeah, because there's not a lot of persecution. Uh, Yeah, so I don't know that there necessarily are better Christians right now. Because we have it pretty easy. Mm-hmm. Well, not the United States, right. but other parts of the well, and also world. China. It's a, you know, just, I mean, the church is just exploding in China and Africa and places like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's always been an ebb and flow in different societies, and as a tree grows, sometimes branches get cut off, and it looks like, oh, the tree's dying. Well, no, it just needed to lose that branch so that it could divert more and grow mm-hmm. in ways that would make sure that it's around for forever. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's never. I mean, it's a it's a slow growth. It's never a. And there are seasons, obviously. There are times when the tree looks like it's dead, it just doesn't have any leaves, and it's not growing at the moment. But it's but give it a few months. Hmm. Dispensationalism. Um, well, apart from the end time uh, eschatology uh, thing, then it seems like um, like so it has the basic. Um, back then it was the age of law, and we had to follow all the mosaic stuff. And then right now is the age of grace, which is why we don't have to follow the law. Um, so as far as that part of dis- dispensationalism, it seems a little more, I guess, more relevant to this discussion as far as whether the law still applies. Mm-hmm. When well, the term dispensationalism comes from dispensation, where there are diff- different dispensations throughout history. You have the dispensation of law, and then you have the dispensation of grace. So it's basically a mode change to where the way that God changes 
changes and the law that he applies to us um, undergoes like really sharp developments to where things are bam now things are very different mm -hmm. and that happened several times throughout the Old Testament I believe but you're against that idea of being different dispensations so they have seven dispensations there's the dispensation of innocence conscience human government promise law grace tribulation and then the final kingdom but you're against separate, separating it up like that because the law was progressively revealed throughout the Old Testament. The God didn't give it all at once. The information dump was with the law. Was No, it was with Christ. Okay. Coming. That was an information dump. That was a very slow, gradual thing that took thousands of years for God to reveal. Okay. And then he stopped, and then there was like a 400 gap where there were no prophets, no further revelation. 400 year gap, and then Christ comes, and then with Christ's death, it basically, I mean, the New Testament interprets the Old Testament and reveals all the sh reveals shadows. So you had this given over thousands of years, and then you had this given within a generation. Mm -hmm. So this is what I would call the information dump. And it really wasn't anything, it wasn't anything new, it was the law being fulfilled and a different way for us to think about the law. A way for us to not suffer the penalty of this, and the way for us to not suffer the penalty of this is to have somebody else pay for it. The eternal penalty, not the civil penalty. Both. Well, yeah, the eternal penalty for sure. Uh, the civil penalty, I believe the reason that God gave that to us is so that we would be seen as wise if we were to obey them. I was talking to another guy. I, I don't know if you listened to the podcast episode, uh, Anarcho Christian. It's his view that we don't have to enforce any civil penalties for anything whatsoever. So people can murder and steal and stuff, and we should not. We shouldn't say you should pay for what you did, because Christ paid everything for everybody forever. Well, he didn't necessarily think no civil penalties. He just thought that we don't have to do the civil penalties outlined in the law, just more whatever we think is just, which doesn't make sense because that's all. Yeah. So either there should be nothing. And he was very definitive about the death penalty. He said, we should not seek to, nobody should ever be put to death or anything. But then for the rest of the stuff, he's like, well, we can if we want to. I'm, I'm waiting for the day when there will actually be people that are like, oh, yeah, I accidentally, like, in a, in, a, in a Christian body, I accidentally killed somebody. I ran over my my neighbor's son accidentally. I want, I'm, I'm, I'm a believer. What do I do? I did something negligent and I killed somebody. What, what do I do? What would repentance look like for that person? I'm sorry. What would repentance look like? So I guess normally they would just spend a certain number of years in jail, according to the way it is right now. Mm -hmm. Repentance would be throwing yourself at the mercy of the person you wronged. And say, I know I can't make this right now, but I want to do what I can. And then what if they just say, um, you should be killed? You're going to die. Yeah. So, well, this, this, not this exact case, but something similar to this happened. Um, if you all remember Zacchaeus. Have I, have I run through the story with either of y'all? Have y'all heard me talk about this? I've heard a little bit, but go ahead. So, um, when Jesus went to go eat with Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus said, I've defrauded people. I've taken too much tax money from them. I want to pay back four times what I stole. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, what the heck, Zacchaeus? Times four, that's a really random number. Wait a minute, you must be thinking of the Old Testament. You shouldn't do that. We're not under that anymore, or we soon won't be after I die. Jesus said, salvation has come to your house. He's like, you got it, Zacchaeus. You understand what repentance looks like. And it's not just a, I'm sorry, it's a, what do I do? Is it feeling good? Do you guys know anything else? Uh, no, everything's great. I guess I'm done with this. Do you know the Wi-Fi password? Uh, yeah, it's, it's right here. here. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. So I think, I mean, that's what God, God looks very favorably on that. When somebody does something wrong and comes and repents and saying, I, I want to make this right. Mm -hmm. And it's I not so much putting a number or a value on it. It's the very act of repentance, right? When, be looking at it the when David sinned and he repented, when God showed grace and mercy to David, grace and mercy is somebody else suffering the penalty, not the penalty just disappearing. So David's four children, God took David's four children. And then there was another time that David sinned. He took a census when God told him not to. Mm -hmm. And God said, okay, I'm going to let you pick. And God gave him uh, either two or three options. Mm -hmm. But I don't I say specifically that God had told him not to. Or was it just like a general thing you shouldn't take sense um, I think David's motivation for doing it was wrong. Yeah, because he wanted to see how well he could fight. Which is definitely against the law, because there's a law that says that um, a king is not allowed to multiply horses for himself, and he's not allowed to multiply wives, and he's not allowed to multiply great amounts of wealth. 
because that would mean that your that both David and Solomon were mm -hmm. Because if you do that, then that tells me that your faith is not in the Lord, who is supposed to be your means and your protection. You think that your security is in military strength and political power and wealth, being able to pay people off. Mm -hmm. Can I actually say why I've seen that specific verse? Yeah, there's a passage in Exodus that says, uh, which David, David obviously disobeyed. Like very early on, he had a, he got a second wife. Um, is that is that the only verse about uh, polygamy, or are there others? I think there are others. That one is specifically for kings. That is Deuteronomy 17:17, 17, 17. and it's interesting to note that a lot of laws don't have penalties associated with them. It just says don't do it. Mm -hmm. He shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away nor shall he acquire for himself himself excessive silver. Well, and those are sort of general guidelines. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say he shall he shall not he shall have only one wife, he shall not acquire many wives. I guess many could be more than one, but my my translation says he shall not multiply wives for himself. Mm -hmm. This is the SV way you use it. This is a New American standard. Okay. And then verse 16, moreover, he shall not multiply horses for himself, mm -hmm. nor shall he cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses, since the Lord has said to you, you shall never again return that way. So that's one that I see uh, America very strongly disobeying. Mm -hmm. Our security is on our military power. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is funded by theft. Mm -hmm. It's like, if this is so good for me, then why can't you just let, let, let me decide whether or not I want to pay for this? Mm -hmm. God doesn't command me to tithe to the American military. Mm -hmm. He commands me to tithe to him. That's the only mandatory thing that God requires that I spend money on or give money to. But there's no penalty for not tithing either. There's, there's not a civil penalty. God will judge me, and God does judge nations who refuse to tithe. Yes. The governments come in and take money instead, just like in 1 Samuel 8, when Israel asked for a king, God lays out a whole list of things that's going to happen, mm -hmm. and the, the tremendously terrible judgment that the king was going to impose was 10% taxes. Like, buckle yeah. up, Israel, are you guys ready for this? He's going to take 10% from you? Yeah, that would be awesome. That's, that's <laughs> your, if a government taxes you 10%, it's claiming to be God. No, no. It's claiming to be equal with God. You owe me just as much as you owe God. And it's also a double burden because even when we're being taxed, we're still supposed to give. And so it's a double penalty, which is a theme throughout the law. But everybody today uh, pretty much agrees that they want uh, military and everything. Like, they don't mind paying taxes for that. Then feel free, but let me out. <laughs> well, I guess you can move. Yeah. Thing. I just don't know any other place that doesn't have it, so. Yeah. Yeah, that's another thing that um, that could be a practical discussion. Um, mm -hmm. Taxes, what do we do with taxes? My view is that the same as, well, Jesus mentioned it several times. Um, there were some men that came out gathering the temple tax. And Jesus and Peter were together. And Jesus asked Peter, what do you think, Simon? Uh, who do they take this tax from, from their sons or from other people? And the sons are free, is what he said. And yeah, Peter said they take it from other people, not from their own sons. And Jesus said, then the sons are free. Nevertheless, so it's not and, then he, and then he, to not get defense, and then he provides Peter with the, the means to pay it. That's when Peter goes and he finds the coins in the fish's mouth. The sons, as in? The sons of the people collecting the tax. Mm -hmm. So that just be Americans, I guess? We're, we're supposed to be free. Paul said that if we can get our freedom, then get it. But while we're still under, let's say it's oppression, then we should seek to redeem our oppressors. And so pay the tax anyway. Redeem them as in? Redeem them in a civil sense, in a, in a criminal sense. Like political reform? No, pay, pay, pay double what they ask. Because if it's true that I owe taxes, and they say that I, let's say they say I owe 10%, I owe 10%. Well, if, I, if I'm in debt to somebody and I owe them something, it's because of something wrong that I did. Biblically speaking, that's the only reason that you can be in debt to somebody. There had to be some kind of theft somewhere, in some way. Besides the 10% that uh, you would usually... So if I stole something and they're saying I owe 10% back, I don't owe 10%, I owe 20%. Mm -hmm. And so if they're right, then I should pay it. If they're wrong and they're stealing 10% from me... Then they have to pay then they're going to have to pay. Because I understand that the law the law happens. God exacts it from us when we don't exact, when we don't apply the penalties to ourselves. And so if somebody steals $10 from me, 
and I think I've, I've mentioned I've mentioned this quite a bit on my Instagram. Somebody steals ten dollars from me, I want to give him ten dollars because later on, when I know God will exact justice from that person at some point, the penalty for stealing ten dollars is twenty dollars. And so if somebody steals ten from me and then I give him another ten, when God requires the twenty dollars of him, he'll have the means to pay it back because I provided him with it. And that's exactly what Christ did for us. We owed God a life that we couldn't give, and so God gave us a life so that when God comes to me, Adam Terrell, and says, I require you of your soul, well, I have an extra one. Here, God gets Christ back. And now that's he's purchased me. He redeemed me. And so now my life is his. Jesus said, um, think of yourselves as unworthy slaves who when they come in from working the field, the master doesn't say, recline a table and eat and drink. He says, no, serve me while I eat and drink and then afterwards you may eat and drink. And your attitude should be, we're, we're unworthy slaves. We did. We only did what was our duty. But it seems like if, well, somebody could use the argument that um, as far as civil penalties, if they killed someone or had an abortion, then um, if the law requires for them to die, they can say, well, since Jesus died, then that's the extra life that was paid. Like they could so, use that argument. Yeah. So this is a this is a terrible thing, and it's uh, Paul says, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Uh, Paul said that sexual immorality even being named among you is already a defeat for you. So we're believers, and then somebody goes and has an abortion. That's so unthinkable. Such a such a horrible repudiation of the grace that Christ has shown to us that I went and I purposefully killed somebody after Jesus Christ died for me. What do you, what do you do with a person like that? Are they are they applying God's grace to their life? It should be, no, Christ saved you, and so now you have a life to where you can go and you can save other people. We're Christ's body. We're supposed to be his hands and feet to the world. So you're basically saying that it just misuses that and applies it to the civil sense instead of the eternal sense. Yeah, there is a difference. The, the, civil, the civil sense has always been a picture of the eternal. And it's supposed to be a schoolmaster. Uh, on the road to Emmaus, Christ laid out all the scriptures that were pointing to himself. All of the law is an instructor about Christ. And so it's very important. It's obviously not, inter not as important as the eternal sense. Restitution, repentance, penalties for theft, um, the kinsman redeemer, all these things in the law that are laid out, every single one of them is, is a picture in some form or fashion of Christ's redemptive work. And most of it is laying out the penalty of what's required. So it introduces, it, it reveals the problem of sin, the consequences. Without the consequences, nobody would really care whether Christ died or not. I don't know about that because, well, right now the civil penalties are not in place right now, so they still care. I think that's why a lot of people don't care that Christ died. Okay. Because they don't have a clear uh, a schoolmaster in the law mm -hmm. teaching them of what God requires. They, as far as non Christians. They kill somebody and they're like, well, that's not so bad. I don't really have a problem. I'm not in debt to anybody. I'm not, I'm not afraid of being executed or anything like that. And so they're given a wrong understanding of what sin is and what the penalty is. When Moses gave the Israelites the law for the second time in Deuteronomy, he said, keep these laws and do these laws so that you will be considered wise and understanding in the sight of all the peoples. And that's Deuteronomy 4. That's the whole reason that it was given, so that we would be seen as wise and that the world would know that our God is the real God. And it was briefly that way in Solomon's time. Queen Sheba would come and give him incredible gifts because of the wisdom and the problems that he was able to solve for her. And evidently thousands of other smaller kingdoms that he took wives for, or concubines. Law outside the body will kill you. Law inside your heart will give you life. Isaiah, I'm going to read Isaiah 2. This is, the, this is probably one of the three or four key passages that talk about what the new covenant is. The word which Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it will come about in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains, and will be raised above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. The mountain of the Lord is called Zion, oftentimes. To the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. This is talking about the new covenant. For the law will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between the nations, and will render decisions for many peoples. 
and they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. I think the last part of this is still in progress. We haven't come to the full realization of this. This is what the full realization will look like. And also Micah 4. What did you say the mountain was? God's nation. Zion. I think it was Daniel giving, interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream. There was the statue that had the head of gold, and then it keeps going down, and then at the very bottom, it's feet of iron mixed with clay. And then a stone comes down and crushes that statue, and then that stone grows to a mountain and fills the whole earth. Which is the kingdom of God. Yes, and that stone was Christ, which was laid. It was a chief cornerstone. So putting all of the um, mosaic laws into practice would be... It would have a lot of implications politically. Are you wanting to reform our system right now? I think we should start with ourselves. But you can't put it, put the laws into place with just ourselves. I think we can turn some heads. Yeah. Where is Micah? Where's Micah? I, I don't have time to sing the song in my head. Uh, which passage are you looking uh, Micah chapter 4. Yeah. Uh, which uh, verse? Starting uh, I think it's the whole chapter. And it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and the peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come up, will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty distant nations. Then they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never will they, and never again will they train for war. Each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree, with no one to make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. First uh, Corinthians six. This is in regard to the man that knew his father's wife. Paul uses it as an instruction, saying, "Hey, you're the ones that are supposed to be the judges. You're they're supposed to be the righteous ones, and you can't even judge yourselves properly and keep yourselves from sexual immorality." We're supposed to be we're supposed to be so righteous as to be above reproach, so that people will come to us. Does any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare to go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you incompetent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? So if you have law courts dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint them as judges that are of no account in the church? I say this to your shame. It is so that there is not among you one wise man who will be able to decide between his brethren. But brother goes to law with brother, and that before unbelievers. Actually, then, it's already a defeat for you that you have lawsuits with one another. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? On the contrary, you yourselves wrong and defraud. You do this even to your brothers. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Paul's talking about a capital crime here. Which verse? In chapter 5. It's actually reported that there is immorality among you, and an immorality of such a kind that does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. And Paul says if that person won't submit to be judged, then you cast him out. But we still can't really do any of these things with the government in the way. So. The government, I think at this point, I wouldn't consider it in the way. I would consider it um, God's mercy because believers are not in a state to where they, we can judge ourselves properly because nobody, nobody values two-thirds of this book in terms of specifics or at least spiritual principles. There's another way that people, that's probably the most popular way that people will divide the Old Testament, and that's, yeah, the Old Testament law is good, and it's divided into three categories, the civil, the moral, and the ceremonial. And they would say that the ceremonial is gone, and the civil is gone, and the only thing that's left is the moral. I don't see that being based in Scripture. In Hebrews, the only way that the old law and the new law is differentiated is between light and shadow. And that's it. And so my view is that everything in the Old Testament still applies, and where we fail to exact it, God does it. The question is, what in the Old Covenant is shadow? That we have something better now. So like the temple was an obvious example of shadow. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have the light of that in the New Covenant. Mm -hmm. We have something better. You wouldn't want to go back to the shadows. And there are other things in the Old Testament that I think are shadows that we should not go back to. But that means that it's been superseded. It's been further revealed. It has to have been further revealed in the New Testament for us to know that. Mm -hmm. So you're saying it wouldn't help to uh, try to politically reform the government because right now the people, uh, even the Christians, don't even believe that the Old Testament should still be the Bible. My goal is to reform myself. Yeah, but if, if your whole idea is to go back to uh, implementing the Mosaic Law, then but you can't do that if the government's the way it is right now. When the Pharisees were under Roman law, they basically had to go and ask the Romans, hey, can we execute this person according to our laws? Mm -hmm. And Rome would either say yes or no. They would, because they were under judgment for not being obedient to God at that point. 
Under judgment as in Rome was overwhelmed. God used Rome to judge his people, and he often does that. Whenever God's people is disobedient, the way that God judges them is he brings in a foreign ungodly nation to clamp down on them and cause them to repent. And so I see a lot of Christians that support everything that the government does. But not, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say everything. They, they support a lot of things that the government does that are clearly outlined as God's judgment. And they say, well, these are good. How can you be against them? In which sense I say, I'm not necessarily against them, but I recognize them as God's judgment on us for sinning. Yeah, but I'd say for ignoring his commandments. The government is still a lot easier on us than it was I thought. That depends on how you look at it. Is it easy to let a uh, crook go free? In the short term, maybe it's easy for the thief, but I think for society as a whole, it's a very hard thing. God says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. I, I find this rather fascinating that God has a, a set of laws for every person that has ever lived and it fits in the book on this table. If you take just the books that have been written in the last year that have been added to Texas state law and federal law, like I don't think this room could hold it. Like They go into the motivations that people have. Did you intentionally do this? There's, there's a law in Texas right now. Um, you can't open carry a handgun unless it's on a belt holster or a shoulder holster. If you're wearing an ankle holster, it must be concealed. Unless something the wind blows or something like that and it accidentally reveals your gun. So if you didn't intentionally reveal your gun, then it's okay. But if you did it on purpose, then it's a crime. So there they're going into the intentions of the heart. <laughs> Texas law. So And the only reason that I know that is because I looked up all this stuff. Because when I was getting my handgun, I was interested in all that. So bringing all this sort of really fun, large picture stuff to think about. Uh, the very practical thing that I was really wanting to get to discuss when Moses was rendering judgments for the nation and he was working night and day and he could, didn't have time to hear all the cases there were so many of them his father-in-law Jethro comes to him and says why don't you tell the people to set judges over themselves so that they can take care of all the easy stuff and then the big ones work up their way of appeals and then you decide and save a lot of time if as in our current society there are very few people that I would trust to hear believers that I know that I would trust that knew enough about the law to hear and judge rightly in like very complicated sexual crimes, capital crimes, things like that. So that's why you don't want to politically reform um, our laws because I don't think we know enough. I don't think we know enough yet. I don't think I don't think God's people as a whole knows anything enough about the details of very difficult cases and how to judge them. I see the people that I do know that, that are really serious and look at all this type of stuff, I posted, I'll, I'll, every once in a while, I'll post something that I post on my Instagram, I'll post in this Facebook group. And the, the people that attack me in that group is just, it's incomprehensible, the things that they say to me, if they disagree. They'll, they'll accuse me of having twisted sexual fantasies, and I'll just be like, I, I, I just want to talk about what this says. Like, if, it's, if, if I'm wrong, help me reason through where I'm wrong. This is a Christian group? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, 1 Corinthians 6. We're incompetent to judge ourselves. So the people that I see, that I would, my first guess would be, they know quite a bit more about this than most Christians do. They still are a million miles away from a proper attitude of judging. They judge with an intent to condemn rather than they judge with an intent to penalize in order to restore. Because God's law, God's justice is meant to be restorative. If I steal something from somebody, I restore back what I stole from him. So I fix it. Not restorative is our current system of justice. So would you like to change it? If you could, like aside from just the judging part, if you could uh, work to change the political laws, like as far as some of the basic things like stealing and killing and stuff like that, would you try to do that? I think we should definitely be vocal about it. Um, in terms of me being able to force other people to do it, I can't do that. I don't think it would be right, and I don't think it would be possible. You don't think it would be right? As in you can't force everybody to obey the Mosaic law? Paul said, um, what have I to do with judging outsiders? God judges those outside the church. God judges those outside the body. So if we can't reform the government, and we can't do it without the government, and basically you can't do it either way. We, I think God will provide the means for us to judge ourselves properly. I think he'd look very favorably on that. As in allowing the government to what? The government to, to, gov the government to see if there, were, there have to be an actual solid group of Christians that want this in a, in, a, in a local area that are all together, not super spread out. Because there are enough people that there might be you know, 100,000 people that think this way in the entire world, but they're also spread out. That group needs to grow. And I see people making tremendous strides in rolling back bad laws that the state has, and they're not even Christians. The state is very open, at least the state of Texas, 
is very open to changing laws. Uh, firearms laws is one example. Basically, one guy that I know is almost single-handedly responsible for changing and rolling back tons and tons of really bad, ungodly firearms restrictions in the state of Texas. The reason that Texas got open carry was because of this one friend of mine. He got arrested for doing something perfectly legal, and he's like, Texas is way too restrictive. We're supposed to be a gun state. Everybody thinks this is a gun state, and we're probably the 10th worst out of all 50. And so he's like, that needs to change. And so he passed a law that made it cheaper and easier to get a license. Was he already in politics? Mm -hmm. He was just some guy. He lives down in Temple. He was a, he was a retired army sergeant. Mm -hmm. He got arrested for walking out in, in the country with a rifle for hogs because he was helping his son do his hiking for his Boy Scout, uh, for a badge. Mm -hmm. And an officer arrests him. He, he, the officer gets out of his car and asks him, what are you doing? Pulls the gun off of him, draws a gun, and points it at his head, and, says, and, and arrests him. And he's like, he's walking down the street. This is, there's a video of it, you can see it online. Mm -hmm. And he's like, this is Texas, this is hog country. I'm out in the middle of nowhere with my son. And I have a rifle for hogs. And there's maybe a thousand people that he has interested that have been sort of helping him. And they'll like maybe call the Texas state capitol. The Texas capitol, you call a representative. I've heard stories about them saying that they've gotten a lot of calls on this particular subject over the course of like a month. And I'll say, so how many calls is a lot on an issue over the course of a month? And I'll be like, 10, <laughs> 10, 12. That's, that's when you know something's like really good. Mm. Wow. But as far as like um, just prison sentences and like implementing some of the basic things, like instead of going to prison for however many years, um, just uh, repay what you're supposed to if you stole something uh, or um, capital punishment, like, as far as some of the basic things, I don't think it would be a problem to enforce those. I mean, you have to have some sort of system, so, but it'd be better, like, as outlined in the same law. Like, some of those things, it wouldn't be a problem to enforce on other people, I don't think, because, I mean, you have to have some sort of penalty. So wouldn't we do better to try to change it towards that? I think, you, you to start with, you'd have to have some sort of community of believers that if, if they were perceived as having done something wrong, somebody outside the church, that's when the state gets involved. If there's a theft or whatever, if somebody, if they agree to it and they fix it and they don't press any charges, the state doesn't care. That's fine. I think that's, that's something that's easy and that everybody would agree should be something that we should strive towards. No theft and when it happens, here's how to resolve it. And I think a lot of people are ignorant about the specific details on how to resolve it. And I've seen a lot of pastors give really bad advice for people on how to solve things like that. Even very simple things, very trivial things. As soon as it comes to, or let's say somebody outside the church steals from somebody inside the church, we could still we can still drop charges if the person agrees. Hey, I'm, I won't press charges if you pay me two hundred bucks because you stole my shoes or whatever. I paid a hundred for them. You owe me my shoes back plus a hundred bucks, and then we won't press charges. I think the vast majority of people would be all over that. They'd love to do that rather than go to jail. Mm -hmm. And, and have something on their record. Yeah. 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 yeah, like you can't even you can't even fight against the theft charge for hundred bucks. The lawyer alone is like 500 an hour. Not to mention all the time and everything of mm -hmm. your time that yeah. it would take to, to go through the court system and everything. I see a huge need. I see a huge need there. There's so much injustice and the courts are so backlogged. I don't know what the courts would say, how they would respond. Do they want the, the stupid cases gone so that they don't have to listen to them anymore? I know a lot of police officers want that. Mm -hmm. The time that I spent working with police officers, I suggested it to one of them once and I said, so what if, to call you out here, Somebody had to pay five bucks every time you came out here. Hmm. And he said, well, no, you wouldn't do that because some people couldn't afford five dollars. And I said, well, wait a minute, you just told me that you're frustrated that all these people don't think of your time as very important and just waste your time. So your time isn't worth five dollars? And he's like, well, that, but it's okay because all the people that do have the money to pay in taxes pay for all these people that are idiots that I hate having to respond to calls for. Oh, interesting, yeah. And I'm like, wouldn't this solve the problem? Because all the officers that I talk to, I'm like, where does 90% of your time go? And they said, doing stupid stuff that I shouldn't be doing. It doesn't concern me, and I can't fix. I can't do anything about it, and I have to respond mm -hmm. because I belong to everybody. And my brother, Trent, EMT, um, he has a very negative view of, um, well, not a negative view of the, them as people, but of homeless people because um, they will abuse the, um, mm -hmm. the ambulance system. Basically, they were called the ambulance because they want a free ride to you know, either the hospital or wherever you want to go, and they have to respond. Um, 
So yeah, and that's why those services are so crazy expensive, right? Because the people that really need it are having to pay for all the other people that don't need it. Yeah. And that's just a simple economic thing. That's socialism in action right there. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. How did you How did you work with the police officers? I worked on the cops TV show oh. for about for about five months. Which is like two and a half years, two and a half or three years ago. Just recording this stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you have a lot of crazy stories that I haven't. I can send you all my journals if you want it. I think it's actually very useful. I'm thinking about publishing it. You should. As far as the thing that you posted last night about the petrol and uh, stuff about that, um, it, it, I don't know, are you, it almost sounds like you're saying maybe. I just want to be clear. I'm not totally sure about my position on that yet. But uh, like, it almost sounds a little bit like arranged marriages here because the father is uh, deciding at a pretty young age, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of what, where you're going with that? Arranged marriages um, degree? I don't necessarily have a problem with arranged marriages. I was talking to somebody this morning who was messaging me on this, um, and that's not something that I'm totally sure. I mean, at sort of a first glance, it seems like the scripture is saying that that's, it's permissible for a father to completely arrange for his marriage for a daughter, and she has no say. Yeah, it's permissible, but I don't know if it's the best way. Obviously, if he has any kind of relationship with her, he would obviously have her best interest at heart. Right. Uh, Deuteronomy 7.3. And I'm, I have to look more into the, the original languages of this phrase to make sure that I'm not reading any, anything into this. Hmm. Once they're betrothed, is it possible to change who they're betrothed to, or is that... First, in, in the case of sexual immorality, yes. Um, Deuteronomy 7.3, you shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons, or taking their daughters for your sons. So it says, giving, giving your daughters to their sons. It sounds like the decision is up to the father alone. Um, what verse is that? Deuteronomy 7.3. And then also 2216. This is real countercultural stuff, guys. I'm very careful with what I say here. Yeah, that's the thing that I posted in the Facebook group. Like, hey, this is these are just some thoughts. If this were the case, th this is these are some results that I could see from this position. Results of that. And then also, I'm not sure about the historical context of this. Like, is that was was this a motivating factor? Somebody said that Mary was betrothed to Joseph when she was like between 13 and 15, or something like that. I'm not sure if that's, I don't know if I can say that from scripture, but I think somebody did some research and said that that's likely, and that's very possible, which I would agree is possible. But, but you're saying that... Uh, like, was this, was this law in Deuteronomy 22 versus 28 29, was that the motivating factor or something else? Like, I was lo looking for people's input, and then I've also had some good discussions with people about the definitions of certain words in that passage um, and how, how else they're used, because the word for uh, to hold can mean violence or can, might not mean violence. And then I, I did a word study and I looked and I found in the Old Testament every time that word is used and when does it mean violence and when does it not. And the vast majority of the time it does mean violence, but it's but it, there are some times in context where it doesn't necessarily, it could, but not necessarily. So that's a big, that's a big discussion. And rather than getting into the text with me, and like talking through this type of stuff, and then okay, well then why does it specify betrothed here and unbetrothed here? Why not, if this applies to betrothed and unbetrothed, why not just leave the phrase betrothed out altogether if this applies to both? And like, nobody will have any of that. They just start calling me names and telling me that I should be excommunicated from the church and stuff. I'm like, this isn't even my position. Mm -hmm. Let's okay. talk about okay, this. Okay, but you said that um, the betrothal can only be changed due to sexual immorality? Because at that but point otherwise... it would be considered a divorce. Okay, but otherwise it can't be changed? I think if it can be changed, it would be considered a divorce, and then you'd have to look into when is divorce permissible. Yeah, but if, so if they're betrothed at um, that young of an age, I mean, lots of times um, they wouldn't even have their whole personality developed. Like, maybe they want to, I don't know, maybe goes one, one direction with their life um, at whatever age, 15 or whatever, that they get betrothed. And then when they get, like, more like 20, they might want to, like, be a missionary or something. Like, it, it doesn't make sense to be betrothed at that young of an age because they don't even know where they want to go yet. Yeah, I understand that. Um, like, even if the father has their best interest at heart, he still wouldn't know exactly the right person. I think one of the reasons that this is that it's still hard for me to think through this being the case, too, if it is indeed the case, is because I grew up in, sort of, in a very aimless home. Still trying to figure out what my life is about. It's 28. I, I grew up learning a whole bunch of different subjects that I don't even remember what they were about anymore. And 
it's like, what, what is my life about? Mm. All the homeschoolers I talk to, have, I think, feel the same way. A lot that I've had deep discussions with. But then, like, yeah, I just need like three or four years to figure out my life. And I'm like, you're 26. I'm 28. Why am I just learning all this stuff? You can say, I don't believe it, but it's interesting. Let's talk about it. I wonder if maybe it's just simpler than what we, what we think and understand. We don't really want to make a rash choice in But ultimately, our lives are, we are meant to be poured out as an offering to God in our lives mm -hmm. and to spread the gospel. And really that's the only command that we have in the New Testament for Christians is to spread the gospel. There's two uh, that I know that I can think of off the top of my head. There's at least two new commands in the New Testament. One is um, uh, there's one time where Jesus said, a new command that I give to you, that you, love one another. that you love one another as I have loved you. Right. That's Which related to the gospel, though. Yes. Gospel. And then the Great Commission is, it's not spread the gospel, it's teach them everything whatsoever I have commanded you. To disciple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the gospel includes, the gospel includes with the law. The gospel is according to the law. Sure, sure. We are, but that is, I think, if we figure out, what I'm trying to say is if we figure out in our own lives where God has placed us and the opportunities that we have to do that, then that's what we need to, we need to take those opportunities as they are presented to us, you know, mm -hmm. and maybe that is, that's just our, that's our, our mission, is our goal right there. Not so much to figure out like, well, I mean, not saying that it's not wrong to, because like you, I have been thinking about these things for a long time. I feel like I've wasted my 20s in many ways because I was not um, committed to serving God in, you know, in every, I guess what, what I'm trying to say is I wasn't, I didn't take full opportunity of the opportunities that were presented to me to live out what it means to be out in the world, to you know, the Great Commission, serving God in that way. I didn't even know what an opportunity would have looked like if it had bit me in the neck. I'm not sure I would have either, but I think maybe that, in many ways, as Christians, we're not really taught to take advantage of those opportunities. And it could be as simple as, um, for example, you know, if I'm at a, I'll just give one example of something that I've been thinking about recently that I've been convicted of, and that was, um, I was at a wedding. Uh, this was like a year or two ago. And uh, the bride and bridesmaids were, you know, this is pre pre ceremony. Mm -hmm. Were you all videoing about, or just a I was videoing. Yeah, yeah, I don't hang out with the bride and bridesmaids before the ceremony. <laughs> okay, okay. Usually. <laughs> that would be really nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I didn't hear that you say that part. Yeah, no, so I'm videoing. You know, and they're having their makeup done and everything. And uh, the bride was they're talking about abortion and like how, like, oh, it's, you know, how, you know, I'm like, oh, we can't go back to these laws to outlaw abortion because what about, you know, the, the horrible things that women did when the laws were in place, you know, to, you know, the, the dangerous uh, ways that they had to go about killing their kids before, you know, before they were allowed to Oh no, what kids. a terrible and situation. Right, right. And I'm over there and I'm like, here's a wonderful opportunity to, if not like outright, not in a bad way, but to just like ask questions and just be like, you know, well, why do you think this is, <laughs> and I didn't you. take it, you know, I just, I completely didn't do it. But and maybe that, the time and wasn't right. There's it, a time to, there's a time to be silent. Be. No, it, and it could be. But at the same time, um, you know, actually, I think, actually, I think it was, it would have been a good time to at least prompt, maybe, like, not necessarily say, guys, this, no, what are you talking about? That's, you know, clearly, this is wrong. But rather, like, well, what do you think about this instead? Like, what if, what if um, you know, just, and I don't know, even know what I would say at that point because I'm not a quick thinker. I'm not quick on my feet. Mm -hmm. I have to, um, I have to absorb things, and then I have to like come back and then think about it. And then I'll be like, oh, I should have said that at that, you know, at that moment. Yeah, I've um, seen that meme. It's like uh, arguments I've won in the shower. All your face. <laughs> yeah, it's not me. It's me. Um, and so, yeah. So anyway, I think that's just one example, uh, and I think there are other examples. But uh, you're right. I think it's. Maybe this is where a confidence in God being able to work out his plan in your life would be helpful. And just like saying, hey, you know what, I don't have to have it all figured out. Um, this is the right, this seems like the right way to move forward in my life and I'm going to trust God and see if there are other, um, you know, if, you know, and just go with this decision. Uh, I don't know if that happens, it's just kind of what, what I'm thinking about here, but...
you know, just maybe, not saying this is necessarily a bad thing, but maybe we as a generation it just think too much without acting because we can't. Big life decisions that you have to make. You know, like, what kind of job are you going to do? You know, what, where are you going to live? Who are you going to marry? Things like that. I, and I think this is why a lot of people still live with their parents, as an example, or just, you know, because it's life is comfortable enough to where we don't actually have to go out and, you There's know. a pretty strong economic reason that that's done a lot now and will be done more, too, I, but I we can get into that later. No, no, no. Economically, that's why it's possible for us to, like, stay at home and everything. And so we have, we don't have a sense of urgency to go out and, like, just make a living. You know what I mean? Uh, there was a... Uh, Podcast uh, that I listened to about the art, the art of nameliness. Uh, I've listened to a couple, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he, um, I mean, some are good, some aren't that great. But um, he talks about, he had one guest on um, his show where he talks about his father, who was just like a park ranger. And he found his, he was just happy in his life just being a park ranger. And in a way, he had to be because that's where he was. You know, that's, you know, that's what he, that's the only opportunity that was around. the only opportunity he had. And so he found joy in his work and he enjoyed his work but it was the only opportunity had here we have so many opportunities which is a wonderful thing in a way but it's 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 caused a different problem now where we have so many opportunities and choices exactly exactly so and that's something that I, I agree with that and I think that's what I've been guilty of honestly mm-hmm. so and I think that's I think that's what it, most of our generation are guilty of um, yeah, so when you have options, you want to pick the best one. And I, the question is that a lot of people, and I didn't until probably about six months ago, understand what what are the priorities that I need to have in choosing an option to where I know what is objectively the best one for me at this current time. Mm-hmm. I know the answer to that now, but it took me 28 years yeah, to, to learn to think that way. Mm-hmm. And the first person that got me started thinking that was a guy named Gary North. And he said, sometimes your vocation and your calling are separate, and sometimes they're the same. Mm-hmm. Your vocation is what you do for money and your calling is what you do that's most useful the most useful thing possible for you to be doing for God's kingdom mm-hmm. at any given time Paul's a great example he was a tent maker and you know but that you not know Paul's not known for being right. a tent maker right but and, yeah and Paul also said that I mean he could have demanded things from certain people mm-hmm. and said that the, the uh, laborer is worthy of his wages mm-hmm. so Paul's vocation and his calling could have been the same thing he could have been getting money from ministry yes and which is what so many do for a lot of people that's that's fine but for a lot of people it's, it, it's either not possible or it wouldn't be wise to do so I need to figure out, for, first of all, what's my call? What's what's the thing that if I don't do it, God would have to, like if I were to die, God would have to bring in somebody else to fill that position because it's essential. I think maybe not everybody has that. I think sometimes it's just living faithfully um, and serving in your church. So yeah, the thing is, is that the way the way that I'm irreplaceable is that there's nobody else sitting in this chair. There's right. nobody else that, that has the exact same group of friends that I do. Uh-huh. And, and if you have all those and connections, you have a family, then that is your that's your call, right? You know, the people that are around me, mm-hmm. my church family, my physical family, yep. the people that I know that are in my local community, yep. that I can have some kind of physical face to face interaction with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you're saying that um, growing up, it was aimless, as in not knowing your calling, vocation, both, house, that sort of thing. calling and vocation. So uh, vocation now, I've, I've, I'm slowly coming to a decision. I should probably just read um, this this past uh, couple of months. I've realized there's not a lot of money in video production anymore. Mm. Because look at how many subscribers Indie Mobile has. Everybody's an indie producer now, right? Yeah. And so you've got to go up the next level. And I realized with a lot of my customers that I would ask them, hey, how did that video turn out for you? You got a whole, you know, 300,000 views on Facebook. That's great. What did that mean for your business? And they're like, oh, I can't really think of anything. Mm. Did you get any more customers? Did you get some awareness? Are you looking at any new deals? Yeah, how would I how would I look at that? Yeah. Did you ever take that uh, Paul Xavier uh, course? I didn't. Okay. There's a there's a cheaper one by the guy he learned it from called. Um, okay. Because the Paul Xavier one's forty eight hundred dollars. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Um, you can also look at the. Uh, have you heard of the Harmon Brothers? <laughs> okay, so they have a course. They did um, a bunch of. Um, Sam Ovens. He has the exact same course that Paul Xavier gives him. It's two thousand instead of forty eight hundred. Mm-hmm. Harmon Brothers just have a book. Yeah. They're, uh, they're, they're marketers, basically. Yeah, all the stuff, so, that, all the stuff that Paul Xavier and Sam Ovitz put in their courses, they learned from books. Yeah, yeah. So, but the more money that you spend on it, the more likely you are to do it. They did a lot of um, uh, ads that um, I had been aware of that went viral. Um, 
Oh, it's like a podcast. Interesting. The way that I was able to find um, to find out what I was best suited for is I start asking the question to people that I'm that I'm in the process of currently serving. The people that already we already have a trust relationship. We're already helping each other. You just ask them the question. How how essential is it that I do this? If I left, would anything would that hurt? Would that would anything change? What would that mean if I left? And if it's not a big deal if I left, then what I'm doing here is not the most useful thing that I could be doing. Interesting. You already figured out what you should be doing. I know. I know to ask that question now. Yeah. And I think that's one. Of, that's one of the things that I've been growing with that, uh, with the Instagram page for about the last two years. Most of the people that follow me are people that I don't know personally. Mm-hmm. The people that are like active on the page. There are a few people that I don't know that are just around the country somewhere, and I'll, we'll talk and I'll answer questions. And I had one guy give me a hundred bucks one time for giving him a piece of advice. I was like, that's a random piece of advice to pay me a hundred dollars for, but whatever. Um, but it's like it's a very small group of people mm-hmm. that I try yeah. to be extremely helpful to. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be I don't want to be McDonald's. Mm-hmm. I want to be a family restaurant that everybody in the community knows and and goes to. Mm. Are you more on Instagram or on Facebook? Instagram. Okay. Yeah. I'm on Facebook because I have to be. Mm. I wish I could. I wish I didn't have to do anything on Facebook. So, um, backing up a bit to the part about Moses, Jethro telling Moses, hey, tell everybody to go pick local, like uh, tens, fifties, uh, hundreds, thousands, mm-hmm. and then the heads of thousands. That if a case is too difficult and nobody can give a satisfactory answer, then it'll get brought to you. Mm-hmm. I think that's something that we should strive to emulate in the church, in the community, if I know that you have somebody that I can go to in case of some kind of disagreement. Mm. You You're not just a loner out there that doesn't submit to anybody. Right. If you think about it, that's sort of established in the uh, church with deacons and mm-hmm. elders, and you know, and then you have the, the head pastor. Right. And so that's sort of established in, um, you know, in the New Testament. Not really, not a way, yeah. But the uh, I think that we just need to be more purposeful about figure out like if you already have a head pastor, that would be the person that would that you would, if somebody in the church had a disagreement with you, mm-hmm. there there's a clear path to this is the person to go to mm-hmm. to arbitrate or to mediate between us. I think a lot of people they wouldn't know how to handle something if something came up because they've only ever had one thing come up ever, if that, mm-hmm. and then when it did it wasn't handled properly. You set all this stuff up when everything's going well and there are no disagreements. So that when it happens, it's taken care of. Does the church you're in now do church punishment? Or? For serious things, I would not trust my, uh, my my current elder with making those kinds of decisions. But do they try to do that, at least with smaller things right now? Mm-hmm. No, it's pretty much up to the two people involved. And if they can't come to an agreement, then they have to figure out something because there's nothing that's been arranged beforehand. But you're wishing your church did do that. I'm wishing, I wish that our church and every church was more intentional about that. The way that we're supposed to deal with it, what if you submit to somebody and then they give a bad decision? Well, if both parties agree that it's a bad decision, then I suppose they could agree not to abide by it. But if just one thinks that it's a bad decision and the other one is okay with it, if you agree to that beforehand, you suck it up, buttercup, you agree to that. Pick a better person to hear your case next time, somebody that you trust. Mm. As far as picking one, though, from the church, it'd probably be hard for both parties to agree on somebody because they probably... When everything's going smoothly, I don't think it would be very complicated at all. Okay, so you're saying before even something happens. Okay. Mm-hmm. Figure out who the, tr- who the most trustworthy person is, and this is something that I, that I encourage everybody to do. Find somebody, if you want to solidify it, and say, so that the person can't accuse you of, well, hey, you just picked that person because it's a disagreement with me if it was with somebody else, and you picked this person because you're just going to pick the person that gives you the decision that you want. You have a piece of paper, like, write your name down, give the person permission, give it to the person who's your, who would be your mediator. <laughs> so that you can prove, no, I picked this person a long time ago. For anything, anything that you have a disagreement with, I fully trust this person to make a decision. What that's going to force you to do is to, number one, if you don't know anybody that you would trust, find somebody and start having these conversations with, to under to know them in a personal way, to know what they think, mm-hmm. to know if you can trust them or not. And if you do know somebody, keep that relationship going so that you still and make sure that you're on the same page. And at any time, you can switch it to somebody else as long as there's not something ongoing. Because let's say they make a, they, you, you go to somebody else, they make a really bad decision, and you're like, they would really like to change, but I already agreed. We either never talked about that, or this person has lost my trust because they lied to me or weren't clear. 
I'll let this case finish, whatever, and I'm going to deal with the consequences. And for future stuff, I now pick this other person. That's all the other party would probably have already picked a different, like, if both of them had already picked somebody that they trust, but the person is different, and it'd still be hard for them. Then it would be up to both of those people to then get together and come to an agreement on, a, on another person that they trust, and would hopefully have already. So you see, you would, you would check to see if there's a quick common person, and you had a, you would have already set this up, like in the system that Jethro recommended, you have tens, fifties, hundreds, thousands. Mm -hmm. Well, if there are a thousand, if there's one person that's over a thousand people, and these two people don't have any other commonality with the ten or with the fifty or the hundred, then they could go straight to the thousand. And that's sort of what the American government tried to do, but now all the people that are representatives in Washington represent like over half a million people each. And for senators, it's, it's like three million. It's over three million per senator on average. And there's, and a lot of people think, well, you just jump straight to that for everything. Well, no, you're supposed to have local people that deal with all the small stuff first. So that hopefully it doesn't ever have to waste the time. We're, we're at a point right now where we're wasting people's time because we don't have these more local jurisdictions. We have, it starts at the city or the county, which for me in Collinsville is 1,300 people. Really? There's nobody, there's nobody, for, and I don't even know who that person over 1,300 people in the city is, or the county judge who might be over 20,000. You know, half a million people. You go straight yeah. to that. You're telling me that you don't have anybody before that that you trust. And what's more, you don't even know that guy to know if you would trust him. Let's say he's over you and you have no say in it. Wouldn't you want to have some kind of influence and at least know what he thinks, so that you know things to be extra careful not to do because he has way too harsh a view of a penalty on this subject, or too light over here. So you need to know, hey, this guy's not going to do judge well here. In my opinion, I want to make whatever possible make sure that he never has to hear a case from me about this because I don't like the way he's going to do it because I'm going to have to I'm going to have to deal with it. So the solution to that would be to find somebody in your church, and then also would be good to go talk to the person that is over Collinsville and just get to know what they think. Yeah. Okay. Sounds like a plan of action there. There's a book that I read called Restoring America One County at a Time. I'd really highly recommend it because he's like step one is don't don't send your children to public school. Mm -hmm. If you have the if you have the freedom to do this and you don't do it. What, what are you going to do when all of a sudden the government takes away a freedom? And all of a sudden, if you want to obey God, you have to break the law. You can do this and be faithful to God, and you don't even have to disobey any earthly government. So why aren't you doing that? You have perfect freedom, and it takes nothing from you except a mental decision and a little bit of effort. Yeah. And he goes through, he's like, okay, so how should we, two main points are, do the things that are easy for you to do now, that there's going to be no resistance to. There's going to be no resistance to you going to somebody and saying, hey, I'd like to have a discussion with you. I trust you to make decisions. If somebody has any kind of a disagreement with me and they agree to listen, to let you listen, would you do that? Find somebody that would agree to do that. That's not hard. That's not illegal. Civil cases, that's already illegal. Criminal cases, you're not allowed to do that. Civil cases, there's there are a lot of different organizations. There's the American Arbitration Association. You pay them money, and they have judges that you can go in and hire, and they'll listen to your case, and they'll provide the decision. And it's way cheaper, they get better decisions, and it's quicker than taking it to a criminal court or a, or a tax-funded civil justice court. Except for you wouldn't do that because they're not Christian or according to the law. I would, right. I would personally not do that. I would see maybe there are somebody in there that are Christians, but I would want to know them. I would want to know that first. But yeah, believers are not allowed to take other believers to court before I'm believers ever, for any reason. I don't care if it's murder, you're not allowed to do it. Wait, say that again? Believers? Believers are not allowed to charge believe, other believers using uh, an unbelieving judge, ever, for any reason. Murder, adultery, rape, kidnapping. Oh, you would, okay, so you would take it further than what the what scripture says, or you believe that that's what scripture teaches? I believe that's what scripture teaches. Okay. So basically no Christian should ever go to court because, yeah, okay. And this, again, what, what uh, scripture was uh, it? I believe it's the same First Corinthians. Uh, First Corinthians, that's it, yeah. Five and six. Uh, six. Does, Five and does six. any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare to go to the law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? What verse? First uh, Corinthians six, verse one. He said, "You should rather be, you should rather be wrong and just suffer evil than do that." And that's the main verse that you're citing for. Don't ever go against. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. 
I say this to your shame, it is so that there is not among you one wise man who will be able to decide between his brothers. But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Actually, then, it is already a defeat for you that you have lawsuits with one another. So he's saying it's not only a defeat for you to go to law against each other against unbelievers, it would even be a defeat for you if you have to go to law before a believing judge. That's a defeat also. I get, man, that's uh, practically in our day and age that brings up so many issues. What if a believer brings a suit against you? You know, obviously you are, you're, we should try to resolve it. Resolve it. Mm-hmm. But if the, they goal, don't the goal is to, to never invo- have to involve a third person. Right, but if they don't want to resolve it and they still want to go to court over it, then we, we are committed here to rather suffer the wrong way. Yeah, do do whatever they ask of you rather than let them take you to a court before unbelievers. What is that going to cause me to do? I want to be on the same page with everybody that I know and that I deal with, with every believer. I wonder, though... Because people have the ability to totally mess my life up. Right. I wonder, though, if this isn't to say that this is to totally dismiss this verse. Um, In our day and age, where we are connected to so many people that we don't know, you know, just... How do we know that they really are Christians? I guess is what I'm saying. So, so that's a valid. I, I would say that you have to go and you actually have to like really get to know them. Mm-hmm. I mean, just because they go to church, you know, right. you know this. Just because they go to church, right? Because they say they're Christians doesn't necessarily mean they're brothers of Christ. So, so I had a friend that I had to deal with. Um, she did what, in my opinion, is a capital crime, and then I told her. This is my understanding of the priorities. So, if it's let's say I'm wrong, let's say it's not a capital crime, then this would be number two. If I'm wrong about that, then this would be number three. If I'm wrong about that, this is what repentance would look like for number four. And I said, you should ideally want this one. I know that's unrealistic. We can't expect that of you. The civil government wouldn't allow us to enforce that anyway. The next step down, you should stay single for the rest of your life. The next option down from there is you should be more cautious in your relationships with other guys. And she said, God's going to show me grace so I don't have to do any of those things. I, what I did was wrong, but I don't have to do anything about it. And I said, why not? And she said, because God's merciful. And now she's engaged to marry somebody else. And she's been messing around with him. I told her that I, until something changes... And at this point, it really doesn't mean a lot because it's just me saying this. It's not her whole community saying this. I can't associate with you anymore. I see no change. I see no sorrow. I see no repentance. Moreover, I see a doubling down on the sin. I can't, I can't eat with you. You're not welcome at my house until I see some kind of a change. At this point, that doesn't doesn't really hurt her. She doesn't care. Right. Well, and I think that goes back to this because in the New Testament they had small communities, obviously. And I think everyone had a... The church was so young and everything that was... Um, it's a very small group. It was a very small group. The very fact that you claimed to be a Christian meant that you probably were a Christian. You know, I mean, the likelihood of... Because it was hard. It was hard. Mm-hmm. Because it wasn't something that you, you claimed lightly or just casually. Yeah. Another thing is that if I think if I think any kind of a church said that we're going to start considering these types of things in order to resolve conflicts, this is our guide, and it, like start talking about the specifics of what that looks like, I think you would have a lot of people run and leave, which I think would be a tremendous blessing. I want to know who's on my side, sure. because this girl that I was talking to, I thought she was, I thought she would be, she, I thought she would act like a Christian. And when push comes to shove, she doesn't. If somebody had started talking about this. Let's say she disagreed with it at first and then and stayed. She would have at least been careful not to do any of the stuff that she did. And if she was, let's say she was still intending on doing it, she would have realized the significance of that and just would have left so that she would have never had to deal with any excommunication. Mm-hmm. She would have removed herself instead of having to wait to be forcefully removed. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't look like this mm-hmm. passage necessarily says you can't go into court oh, with an unbeliever as a judge. It just says it wouldn't be a good idea. It says, um, it says it's, it's a very bad witness. Yeah. But we are, we are, I believe, allowed to go to court against unbelievers before either believing or unbelieving judges. Sure, sure. In which case, if we've excommunicated a believer for being an unrepentant sin and they don't agree to be judged by us anymore, I, I would say that we can now treat that person as an unbeliever. As Paul said, if, uh, 
how Jesus said in Matthew 18. He, he lays out the instructions for how to confront somebody. If they won't listen to you, take an additional person with you. And if they still won't listen, talk to the church. And if they still won't listen, let them be to you as a tax collector and an unbeliever. So at that point, once they're excommunicated, once it's very clear to everybody in the world watching, this person is not us. This person is not from us. This person is outside of us. And they've committed something against us. Now we can take them to court in a way that the world would see as uh, agreeable. Oh, here's that. It's not, it's not 18 while I was looking, but there's the passage you mentioned. Again, I say to you if, that if you would, two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, there am I with them. Backing up a few verses. Uh, Matthew 18, verse 15. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have one year brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every fact may be confirmed. He's citing Deuteronomy there. Mm-hmm. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall have been loose in heaven. Again I say to you, that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done to them by my Father who is in heaven. Where there are two or three that have gathered together in my name, they are mine in their midst. Mm-hmm. This is uh... This is great because you see this verse used all the time for people who don't want to go to church or something. Right? Just, you know, eat coffee Jesus is something. talking about so, restoring an unbeliever in sin, or uh, so restoring a brother in sin. Completely out of context. Mm-hmm. So, so basically, the two that it's talking about is the witnesses. Would be with the additional witnesses, yeah. And what is it they're asking would be done? Just that the brother would be reinstated in the church? It just says that if he listens to you, you have one your brother. If your brother sins, show him his fault. If he listens to you, you have one your brother. So listens to you, I would guess that would mean he would listen to you in what, what your desire of repentance look like and how he could make it right. But it says about, um, if do you agree about anything they ask, um, does that seem like maybe what they're asking is that the brother would be repentant and that's what would be done? Because I think most people th- take that out of context to say that just anything, but applied specifically to the... Yeah, I think it would be applied specifically to here. Yeah, but would it mean like um, anything they ask as in like just repentance? Like, what do you think that means? Well, I think it would, anything they ask, I think when, when it uses that, when Jesus uses that phrase, obviously he's meaning uh, according to God's will. Right, but in this specific scenario. So if it's something, let's say somebody stole, let's say a, a fellow believer of mine stole my shoes, and three of us saw it, we go to him, show him his fault, and then if, if I ask him, I want ten thousand dollars, I don't think that would be that would be according to scripture. Okay. So number one, I shouldn't ask that. So about anything they ask, as in restitution. I, I would I would think that that's what this is talking about. But then it says it'll be done for them by my father, and. I don't know, that doesn't seem to make sense because it's... So if, if, if something is done unjustly to me, I know that God will restore me somehow. It may take a while, but God will restore me because God is just. A lot of the Psalms are David crying out to God saying, like, God, when are you going to restore me because of all that my enemies have done to me and attacked me and stolen things from me. It's like, I know, that you, I know God that you're my defender. I know that you will bring me justice. And justice in that sense would be restoring, restoring me to the expense of the person doing evil. So about anything they ask, um, maybe referring specifically to restitution. Um, but it says anything. And like, of course, as long as it's along with the, like in line with the Bible. But well, he's saying again. I say to you. So where where did he say it the first time? Was it just the verse before? Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. So I'm guessing it's I'm guessing that's referring to justice and injustice. Binding as in just laws are binding. Whatever you whatever you bind on earth. Well, um, I wonder if it has anything to do with um, the verse that says whatever you whatever you do to others shall be shall be paid to you a paraphrase mm-hmm. uh, like if you don't forgive somebody else neither will it be forgiven you mm-hmm. so if you bind injustice on earth then you will you will be binding up injustice for yourself in heaven mm-hmm. <laughs> well it could be a reduced reward right. whatever you use on earth well and that's that would be both, both positive and negative because um, back in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, um, 
whomever whoever does the law and teaches them will be, will be called great. Well, and then what do we do with our rank and our greatness when we get to heaven and get to Christ? He is speaking to the disciples here. Yeah, they were asking about which one of them would be the greatest. Mm -hmm. On your story, on the fourth point about um, if she's betrothed, then it would be a capital crime. Wouldn't it already? Like, isn't is that already a capital crime? I think in the, in the Old Covenant, it would not necessarily always have been. The only time that I see, there's only two penalties that require burning. One of them is for girls, and one of them is for men. But girls only if they're the daughter of a priest. And girls if they're the daughter of a priest, and for a man, the penalty is if a man um, has intercourse with a woman and her mother. That's, yeah. that's the only two things that require burning. Everything else is, is stoning. Yeah, but it's still a capital crime. Yeah. So I guess really the only difference that would make would be depending on whether she's a believer or an unbeliever. So if, we, if, if this were being followed in all society, assuming that this is if, assuming that this is even biblical to begin with, then um, unbelieving girls are not the daughters of priests. Yeah. In which case, that's not a death penalty for them. Believers have, would have a higher standard. If, okay, you just said that if they're an unbeliever, it wouldn't be a capital crime. Because they're not the daughter of a priest. What does it matter if they're a believer or not? Because believers are priests. Oh, I see what you mean. And I, I also don't know if that would mean that if a girl is a believer but her dad is not, she's not the daughter of a priest. Hmm. I don't know. But then even if they're an unbeliever, it'd still be a capital crime, just what's done in the center of No, it would not be a capital crime. There is no penalty. If she's an unbeliever and her father does not requ doesn't care to require a marriage or anything, any form of compensation from the man, then it would not be a crime. It'd be a sin. It would not be a crime. A sin, as in no uh, civil penalty. Right. Okay. Which means that <laughs> prostitution would not be something that would be able to be stamped out in penalty. It's something that God judges. That's a sin that God judges and God deals with. It's not something that we should seek to incur any kind of penalty with. And it would also be completely restricted to unmarried people. Because if either one of them is married, then it's a capital crime. Because if, if, a, if a single woman knows a married man, mm -hmm. then they both die. Mm -hmm. Because well, she, committed, she committed adultery, mm -hmm. even though she was single. Because the man's married. Yeah. And the same thing if, if a man is single and he does it with a married woman, mm -hmm. he committed adultery, and so did she, so they both die. Okay. So if there's any marriage involved, it's death. Mm -hmm. If there is no marriage involved on either side, then it's fornication, mm -hmm. which for a believing girl, I would say should be death. For an unbelieving girl, where the father doesn't require anything, God judges that. There are several passages that warn that warn that God uses to warn his people. It says, Do not do, don't prostitute your daughters. It's a sin. And he said the penalty for prostituting your daughters would be that the land would find you out. What's that? That, that um, I know that's what happened when Assyria came and scattered the kingdom of Israel. Okay, so basically, one of their sins was fornication. So basically the fourth point is um, a drug will make it a capital crime if it's for, an unbeliever. For believers, yeah. Okay, and then for a believer it'd be a capital crime either way. Yes, that would be my view, which for most people would not agree with. And I'm still working through it. Mm -hmm. But then, for, let's let's say uh, both are unbelievers. But if she's betrothed, then it'd make it. If it's worse. willing, then it would be a capital crime for both for her and the man. Another thing that I that I understand is that um, kidnapping is a capital crime. Mm -hmm. In which case, if it's involuntary on the girl's part, then in some cases, if not all, would be considered kidnapping. In which case, that's a capital crime. Wait, what was about the girl's part? If it's if it's if it's rape, and the girl is unwilling, if the man if the man steals her away, okay. and her, then that's not, then that's a capital crime. Then, I don't I don't disagree with anybody on that. Um, but my my current view, and I'm still working through this, I'm holding this very loosely. My current view is that if she is not betrothed, then they should marry. And it really all boils down to two verses, Deuteronomy 22. If a man is found lying with a married woman, then both of them shall die. The man who lay with the woman and the woman, thus you shall purge the evil of misery. If there is a girl who is a virgin and betrothed to a man, and another man finds her in the city and lies with her, then you shall bring them both out to the gate of the city, and you shall stone them to death. The girl, because she did not cry out in the city, and the man, because he has violated his neighbor's wife, thus you shall purge the evil from the mother. So the betrothal was legally considered the same as marriage. Uh, but if, but if in the field the man finds the girl who is engaged and the man forces her and lies with her, then only the man who lies with her shall die. So the, if, if she's married and it's rape, then only the guy dies, not, not the woman. But you shall do nothing to the girl. There is no sin in the girl found worthy of death, for just as man rises against his neighbor and murders him, so is this case. And then 
uh, when he found her out in the field, the rage girl cried out, but there was no one to save her. And then in verse 28, if a man finds a girl who is a virgin who is not engaged and seizes her and lies with her and they are discovered, he would have to show me that the word for seize in this context cannot possibly imply force. Yeah, because it seems like it could. But if he did rape her, and according to verse 28, and it was non-consensual, then it wouldn't make sense for them to be married because he's probably an all-around bad man. It would be up to the father, and that is, and I get that from Exodus 22, okay. same chapter. Yeah. It would be up to the father to see if they. It would be up to the father. Right. He could deny it or allow it. Uh, uh, Exodus 22. I think it's verse 22 also. But I don't know why he would allow it. I don't either. But I think that that would be his prerogative. If a man seduces a virgin who is not engaged and lies with her, he must pay a dowry for her to be his wife. If her father absolutely refuses to give her to him, then he shall still pay the money equal to the dowry for virgins. And the way that dowries work, uh, we have different. We have a different uh, connotation of what a dowry is. We think of a dowry as the money that the woman brings into the marriage. Mm -hmm. The way that it works in Scripture, my my, my understanding, subject to further study, uh, is that the husband pays the bride price to marry, so that there is a barrier to entry, and it also would pr prove financial sustainability on the part of the man. That money would go to the father of the bride. And then that and that and that becomes her dowry. So the bride price becomes her dowry. And what that would do is, uh, let's say the husband abandons his wife, that dowry money becomes hers. So it's sort of a collateral, and it, it ensures her financial protection in case her husband abandons. If they do stay married, and he does he doesn't abandon her, then that money then that dowry becomes an inheritance for their children. For his children? For their children, husband and wives. And, it's, and the father holds on to that. For his grandchildren. For his grandchildren. It's interesting that this, that both of those passages give a specific weight in silver as the proper price. And I'm like, why can't you just say, but then in another spot, it just say, it just says he shall pay equal to the price for virgins. So it's like, is it a specific amount of money or is it up to the culture? If a father absolutely refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money equal to the dowry for virgins. So he pays the dowry whether he is allowed to marry her or not. In which case, if that becomes her dowry, then that would be attached to her for a future marriage. So if if she was raped and the man pays the dowry and then is then executed, now there's money attached to her. Now some people might think of her as damaged goods and make her less uh, less desirable to marry, but now she has money attached to her. So that should make her, so that should make her at least somewhat more desirable. But yeah. I don't know why money should make it more desirable. That doesn't sound right. I do think it's interesting, though, that I was talking with Parker about this at the film festival. I do find it still very interesting that girls do have a particular interest in knowing how much their wedding ring cost. Mm. What do you mean? What is that? Uh, it shows how much the guy cares about. But Hunter, no, it doesn't. Just, that's, just, that's just saying that, that she's worth money, That's and that's a demeaning thing. Well, then, uh, if it's not about money, then why do girls care at all? If it's not about money, they probably won't care. And I know some people right. care. I know some who are like, yeah, please don't spend too much money on this ring for me. We need that money for a new car or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. But I still think for the vast majority of girls, they want to know how many months, okay, if I don't know the exact amount, how many months wages did you spend? I think that's just the meaning to both of them. Yeah. I just find it interesting that that's a natural tendency. A lot of I can't comment on it, really. Yeah. Natural I just find it interesting. Which aren't that's true. That's true. Mm -hmm. There is also a sense in which unbelievers uh, see justice they, they recognize justice when they see it, but not everybody does. So take with a with a mouthful of salt. But okay, so going back to what you said about um, if somebody rapes a girl and doesn't marry her, but she still gets the money, um, and then that will be her dowry. But if she marries somebody else, then that other person will also get a dowry. So she's obviously a double. Well, that would be the, well. The man wouldn't get the dowry. Well, yes. So there would be a double dowry. But all, but remember, the man never gets his dowry back. Yeah, so why should he care? Well, because it goes to his children. Yeah. So, yeah, there's money attached to her, but that when the man marries her, that money doesn't go to him or to her, it goes to their children. Mm -hmm. So he's like, what if there's a guy that is having trouble? And he's like, I, my, my children are going to be really bad off because I'm really bad off. Well, all things being equal, if I have several options, why not pick the one where I have the best future for my children? I mean, it's not an amazing amount of money, but it's something. Several options, but it still seems like he shouldn't care because he would uh, pick the one who is 
um, most in line with God in the Bible? What yeah, I would obviously, I, I think that any wise man would, would value that more highly than a slightly larger inheritance for his children. Mm -hmm. Especially if he's good at all. <laughs> he's earning money, I think. I think any guy, would, that wouldn't be a huge difference. But I think it would be a potential for somebody that was, was in dire straits. I, I really don't know. A lot of this stuff sounds bad and weird to me, but I've never seen anybody do it either. Right. So it's like I can't. I don't even know what all the consequences and ramifications of doing this would look like. I have no concept. Of it. Well, I can and speculate, and that's about it. I guess one question I would have, and this is just a question, not really something I thought about, but it seems like with Christ coming, um, we Christians shouldn't be, not saying that we shouldn't be involved in um, government or anything like that, but that's not the main goal of the Christian. That's not the main goal of, you know, so, so I guess what I'm I think that's a bonus at, thing that, that will happen automatically. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to get at is um, how much of the civil things that are laid out in the Old Testament should we try to apply today? Of course, I think it's on a case-by-case -case basis, but how much should we apply to our own lives and government and everything today um, since we're not under a theocracy or anything like that? Uh, I mean, it's interesting to see how this would, how we would um, apply these principles today if we did not under a theocracy. Or, you know, but should that be something that we are concerned with? I'm concerned with obeying God. And I think if I do a good job with that, then I think unbelievers will turn, it'll turn some unbelieving heads. Because Jesus said, we're supposed to be known by our fruits. It's really hard to judge everything when you're just looking at all the stuff that's written down on the page. But when you see it lived out, it becomes a whole lot more clear. What's the end result of Sharia law? What's the end result of Mosaic law? We've seen results of Sharia law lived out. We haven't seen the results of the Mosaic law. So it's easy to say that they would be bad for a lot of unbelievers at this point. Right. right. From e it's yeah. easy to say that that looks crazy. Yeah. And it's anti to not be, be, be better. Talking about Sharia? Uh, mosaic law. Yeah. It's easy. It's very easy for everybody to say that about Sharia because you can see it being written down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And yet it continues. And yet it, can, and yet it continues. Like communism. And it's like nobody has the end result of communism. But it's yeah. like, okay, so why are we still, you know, why is it still so attractive? Right. Yeah. Because we just didn't follow it closely enough. Right. But right. I think, I find it, it it's interesting with the Bible. It's like, even if you miss it, but you, you just do a little bit closer to it the next time than you did before it, you see immediate blessing. And this is So it's like God saying, yeah, warmer, 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 warmer. You're, you're not there, but you're getting closer. Mm -hmm. Rather than like communism, they say, then things are going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse until you're perfectly on and then it's all perfect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's like somebody says, well, there's a light shining behind you. I can't see anything. There's a light shining behind you. I still can't see anything. Still can't, still can't, still can't, still can't. Oh, no, I see everything perfectly clearly. It doesn't really work like that. What about the festivals? Um, like, I can see clearly about the sacrifices. Um, what do you, do you still think that the festival should be in place? Or what? The Jewish festival should be? Oh, the festival. That one's specifically addressed in Hebrews, as well as the Sabbath. Do you think the Sabbath should be binding Christians today? Yes, of course. You do? Okay. The question is, no, you be. What is the Sabbath? What is the Sabbath? Okay. What chapter? The Sab um, so the Sabbath as uh, in the in the uh, in the Ten Commandments. As laid out. The Sabbath has always been the same thing. Explain. <laughs> okay, so Hebrews, uh, I think it's. I have to Google this first. I haven't had to look this up in a while. Uh, Hebrews four. Therefore, let us fear, if while the promise remains of entering His rest. Any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed we have had good news preached to us, just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as it, just as he has said, I, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day. Today, through David, after so long a time, just as had been said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest, so that if no one will fall through, fall through following the same example of disobedience. 
for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, both, both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. And then he goes on to talk about how Jesus is our high priest. So yeah, I would argue that Jesus is our Sabbath. Saturday was a shadow of Christ. And now we have Christ himself. As in he is our rest. Yes. We rest from our works in Christ. Does that mean you don't think that we should have one day a week where we don't do work? It's not a capital crime. <laughs> right. It is a, a damnable sin now, I would argue. That, that law, now that we have the fulfillment of it, now that we have the light, the reality of it, that if somebody does not rest in the Sabbath, that they go to hell. Because if somebody is not resting in the Sabbath, that means they're not a believer. Mm -hmm. Wait, you're saying they go to hell if they don't rest on the Sabbath? Right, because Christ is the Sabbath. So if you're not resting in Christ, you're not observing the Sabbath. So previously, not resting on, on the Sabbath, Saturday, was punished with physical death. Because yeah. working, working on the Sabbath was a capital crime. It always has, it always has been a, a spiritual crime, something that gives spiritual death if you don't, do not rest in Christ. But they didn't have the reality of that in the Old Testament, so they needed a shadow of it, which was the Sabbath, the, the actual day, Saturday. Now we actually have Christ, and so we no longer need a shadow. Yeah, I see how... Uh... Christ is our rest, and on the Sabbath you rest, but I don't see how that makes them equated. We rest from our works in Christ. Christ completed the work for me. Yeah, that makes that makes sense, but where does it say that they're actually equal? Like, where does it say that they're the same thing? There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. I'll need to uh, study this in depth. As for the festivals, yeah, I've never believed that um, uh, the Sabbath as a certain day in the week was a requirement for Christians to keep or anything like that. Yeah, because that would be going back to a shadow. That would be, yes, exactly. I don't work on uh, Sundays. I've decided that that would be a way to uh, to please God. But it still makes sense not to work on I think one day a week. I think it's yeah. fine. No, yeah, yeah, definitely. No, it's a, it's, a, it's a good thing to do, but I mean, is it... Uh, but it's not sin. It, no, no, of course not. Mm -hmm. but, but it, it does also beg the question of, and I've done this before, I have worked on a Sunday where I didn't receive any pay, you know, or something like that, but not to be so strict with myself, with, you know. With keeping that, uh, I need to go here at some point. But uh, when it has, uh, yeah, well, sorry, I'll say this one last passage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, go ahead. Uh, Colossians two. Oh, I, have, um, I was having an elevated status as brothers of Christ, and what the true circumcision is. Uh, chapter two, verse sixteen. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink, or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. These things are a mere shadow of Christ that is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So, food, drink, clean and unclean foods, festivals. New moons, Sabbath days, all of those are do whatever you want, basically. Yeah. There's another one, uh, maybe in the same passage, it says, he who, or he's talking about meat sacrifice to idols. Um, he, who, he who eats does so for the Lord, and he who abstains does so for the Lord. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. So, I think that answered your question. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I did uh, a Seder meal with some friends of ours from church okay. for the first time a couple years ago. A Seder meal, Passover. Oh, okay. And it was, it was really, it was really fun. Very interesting. The way that they do it, and they don't under, like the Jews that still observe it, as a matter of like a, a moral thing that you would be instead if you didn't do it in right. the requirement. Um, they still don't understand all the pictures that shows Christ that there. Like they still set out an extra place for Elijah. And, yeah. <laughs> Your church did that? Uh, somebody at our church, they did it. Just they just do it for fun. They're just like, yeah, this is instructive. And I think it's valuable. <laughs> it was interesting. That would be interesting. They take the way they take three three bits of unleavened bread and they put them in a, in a thing. They take out the middle one and they break it and then they hide a piece of it. <laughs> and that's not that's not commanded in the law. It's just a tradition that's just right. evolved. Right. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Why do they and hide somebody, that so that somebody can you go on a search for it? Somebody finds it. What is the picture of? Christ. He was the one that was broken and buried. Well, I don't want to hold you if you need to get somewhere. Yeah, I gotta go. I gotta do some laundry. Me? I have to do some. Oh, you have to do some library, yeah. Uh, I can tell. You just, you really need to. <laughs> Are we going to do another one of these? No. Um, I thought about it.